This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the Southeast and across the country, focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Uh, our hearts are full. Thank you so much for choosing us for your next half hour of Farmtastic Entertainment. Ray D'Alessio here and the person to my left, the one and only, never duplicated, Jennifer Parson. Yes, only one of me that I know of. But all jokes aside, we have a lot of ground to cover in this show, so let's get started, shall we? Coming up, you're going to hear from the 2024 Georgia Farm Bureau Commodity Award winner, Reg Wilbanks. You'll learn about the legacy of his family's beekeeping tradition and how they've transformed their business from humble beginnings into a global enterprise. And then later, it might be one of the more important conversations we've had in a while. From extreme weather to global market pressures, Kenny Bergamy talks with Georgia Cotton Commission Executive Director Taylor Sills about the challenges facing the cotton industry as a whole and what it all means for Georgia's cotton farmers. These stories and so much more right now on The Farm Monitor. On that note, Georgia cotton producers seem to be facing one challenge after another, from pre-planning issues to the recent impact of Hurricane Debbie. But as John Holcomb reports, experts believe the crop still holds great potential as producers push forward toward harvest. This growing season has certainly been a challenging one for cotton growers here in Georgia. As producers continue to get hit with one challenge after another, time and time again. However, according to Camp Hand, Extension Cotton Specialist, despite those difficulties, the crop still is turning out to be a great one. Up until now, I mean, the crop looks really good. You know, it seems like we've been getting what we need in, in most places. Uh, some of it, you know, that June spell may hit a little harder uh, than others. Some of our earlier planted dry land really in the middle part of the state probably suffered a little bit more from that dry June than other places. Um, but the crop, I, I think, is looking really good. Of course, a big concern is the effect of Hurricane Debbie. However, according to Hand, though there were some direct losses, the crop fared the storm well, as the bowls on the plants hadn't opened just yet. However, his biggest concern is the fact that some producers are not able to get equipment back into their fields, which will hinder their ability to manage and possibly harvest their crop. I think there's definitely some direct losses. But the thing that concerns me a little bit more are the indirect losses from delays being able to get in the field from from dirt roads being washed out and stuff like that. And I, and I mean, uh, we're, we're definitely going to be delayed getting back in the field. And then also, you know, it could take until harvest. And, and you know, the the good news is that that one, you know, didn't wasn't quite as bad as as most people thought. But the bad news is we're still in August and we got us a long way to go. Another concern growers are dealing with are pests, specifically bowl feeding ones such as stink bugs that can do a lot of damage this time of year when the plant is most susceptible. Stink bugs are the primary bowl feeding bug, but we also need to be aware that there are other bug species that can do similar injury. Uh, one that's kind of we're seeing a little more frequently for this late in the season is tarnished plant bug and clouded plant bugs. Uh, but they'll also feed on these developing bowls. But you know, we have a dynamic threshold, but when we're in that third, fourth, and fifth week of bloom, and a lot of cotton is in that time frame where it's most susceptible or most sensitive to yield loss from these bowl feeding bugs. Robert says one other pest to be concerned about is the silverleaf whitefly. As he says they do well in drought conditions, growers here in Georgia saw earlier this summer and need to be dealt with in a timely manner. June was a very dry month and uh, silverleaf whitefly uh, really does well during dry conditions. Uh, thankfully we started receiving rainfall in July, but uh, whitefly numbers did kind of get a foot in the door. But we do want to remind growers, when you see a few white flies in the field, they should uh, influence every decision you make. Reporting in Tifton for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. 
John, thanks so much. More Cotton Talk in just a bit, but first, every year, Georgia Farm Bureau recognizes an individual who's made a lasting impact on the Georgia ag industry with one of its highest honors, the Commodity Award. Yeah, this year's recipient is Claxton native Bridge Wilbanks, who is proudly continuing a family tradition. I grew up in a beekeeping family. I'm actually a fourth generation beekeeper. Uh, the Wilbanks Aprys got started when my great grandfather gave my grandfather four hives of bees for a wedding present in the mountains of Northeast Georgia. And he expanded that number uh, with the help of my father when he came along growing up as a young boy to about 300 colonies and they produced honey sold it in the mountains of northeast Georgia and in the Atlanta, Georgia area. And uh, they lost their home and everything they had to, due to a house fire in 1947, 1948. So they decided to move to South Georgia with their bees where the honey crops were larger, more dependable, and the quality of the honey somewhat better. And the first year down here, uh, as luck would have it, was a disaster as far as a honey crop. So my grandfather went to work in the shipyards in Brunswick, Georgia, and my father went to work with the Georgia Department of Agriculture as a bee inspector. And with that job with the Department of Agriculture, he became familiar with producing packaged bees and raising queen bees. And so the partnership decided to diversify and that facet of the business grew and we gradually, almost totally, phased honey production out. Today, we, the Wilbanks Aprys, which I'm not a part of now, my son's running it, operates about 10,000 colonies of bees and uh, 16,000 queen mating nukes. Uh, we produce uh, about 25,000 packages a year and 60,000 queens but we've shipped bees to uh, Israel, Spain, Portugal, Indonesia, uh, Japan, uh, France, Germany, uh, Scandinavian countries, uh, Argentina, Mexico, you name it, we've, we've shipped them there. Uh, I've contributed our success to uh, hard work, turning down a quality product at a reasonable price and probably most of all uh, the dedicated employees I have. Uh, they work in this kind of heat and inclement weather and uh, when you work outside it's hard to find someone that's dependable anymore and then when you add getting stung to it, that makes it more difficult. Honeybees are responsible for uh, probably over a hundred agricultural crops and uh, uh, there's been estimates that they either contribute directly or indirectly to about uh, 20 billion dollars in farm worth annually. You never understand them fully. You think you have them figured out and then they'll throw you a curveball and show you you have them. And we've kind of created a legacy because when we first came from North Georgia, which I was actually born in South Georgia in 1950, uh, people made fun of us trying to make a living with bees, you know, and uh, it just made me work that much harder. When we come back, we're taking a deep dive into the cotton industry with Georgia Cotton Commission Executive Director Taylor Sills. How much of an effect will Hurricane and Tropical Storm Debbie have on the current crop? And more importantly, what's the future of the cotton industry amidst the rising use of polyester? Challenges are growing. Populations, climate, demand for resources, 
At the University of Georgia's College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, we are growing with these challenges. Joining with fellow researchers around the globe, we are merging traditional agriculture practices with advancing technology and modern tools to improve our world. From the clothes we wear, to the food we eat, to the water we drink, our scientists are doing the work that is needed now to create a more sustainable future for generations to come. Through teaching, research, and extension, we are equipping producers and the next generation to become our nation's leading advocates for progress and conservation. Our researchers are examining the tiniest molecules and the largest industries to transform the way we grow our food, protect our environment, and care for our people. From rural landscapes to urban communities, our experts are on the ground working to build safe and sustainable food systems, improve environmental stewardship, and better people's lives in Georgia and beyond. We are CAES. Join us as we commit to the health of our planet and the well-being of the people on it. Well, U.S. cotton farmers have faced a roller coaster of challenges this year, from unpredictable weather to market pressures. Despite these obstacles, the state of the cotton industry remains a crucial topic as it impacts everything from local economies to global trade. Our Kenny Bergamy recently caught up with Taylor Sills, executive director of the Georgia Cotton Commission, to discuss the current state of cotton in Georgia and beyond. In part one of the conversation, they explore the effects of Hurricane Debbie, the global influence on U.S. cotton, and what the future might hold for this year's vital crop. Taylor, this is a great looking field out here. It sure cotton. is, yeah. Is, is this pretty much what we're seeing across the state with cotton? Uh, yeah, uh, three weeks ago, if you asked me this question, I would have said, you know, Kenny, I don't know. We've been through so much with this cotton crop this year. You know, we've, we had a late start. We had the wettest May we've ever had. We had an extremely hot June, dry June. And now we've had this hurricane and all kinds of things, but you know, our cotton is better than, than it probably deserves, uh, given the weather. Uh, conditions thus far but you know this we, we've got a good ch chance to make a good crop we still got to figure out the exact implications of hurricane tropical storm debbie last week but uh you know we, we all in all we have a, a decent crop i think that was my next question was about the the weather related to damages can you give me some kind of quick assessment about what it looks like across south georgia you know people there were parts of the state that thought they were going to get a rain that could use a rain that didn't get a rain uh then you know uh, I know in parts of you know, East Georgia, they got as much as 18 inches of rain. Uh, there's cotton blown over uh, the whole way that the storm went. I just don't know, we don't, we don't know yet. Where we are in the de developmental stage of the cotton, it's just too early to get, put an exact figure on what we lost. Um, but there will, there will be some losses. And the biggest problem with that, Kenny, is you know, with where we're at with the market right now, with where our uh, you know, Title I support through the farm safety net Established, you know, this hurricane puts that producer even further behind the eight ball mm -hmm. than they already were. So, any projections into the end of this year and into 2025 is kind of a question mark right now, isn't it? That's right. Is this indicative of what we're seeing across the southeast, not only in Georgia but the other? It's the whole country and the cotton. Yeah, you know, we grow cotton from Virginia to California and up uh, up to Kansas. And you know, I, I, I venture to say that every acre of cotton in the United States will lose money this year. For people that don't realize the foreign influence has so much uh, influence on what we do here with cotton in the United States, the state of the cotton industry, we hear so many people say people aren't wearing cotton any longer like they used to. Give me just a synopsis of what that so, looks like. So you know, one thing what the, we, we do hear about, we hear about consumers not being able to find cotton. We hear about uh, you know not being made in the U.S., but just to tell you, through Yarn and raw cotton sales, we export 95% of our cotton crop every year. So if a, when a consumer goes to the store and buys a cotton garment or a cotton sheets, even if they're made somewhere else, there's a non-zero chance that it came from the U.S. I mean, the U.S. grows 10 to 12% of the, the world's cotton crop, I think. Maybe maybe it's a little more, a little more than that. And you know, we've got, uh, anytime that a cotton garment comes off a shelf, that makes room for another one. So if I look at a shirt, and when I'm buying on, at the store and it says 100% cotton, there's no way that I can know that that's 100% U.S. That's right. And, and more than likely what they do is 
it, we call we call them different growths. So uh, there's a southeastern growth, there's a West Texas growth, uh, there's a Brazilian growth, there's an Australian growth, there's a uh, a growth in French West Africa, and all of these growths have their own typical attributes. Uh, so what this what that what that manufacturer is trying to do is blend that together to make the exact product that they're trying to make. Uh, and so you know, you know we, we would love it if we could have all uh, American or even all Georgia cotton products. We, we know there's some of that going on now. Um, but at the end of the day, we want people to buy cotton to make room on the shelf for more cotton or maybe to expand our shelf space on cotton. My wife will go into the store and she's looking for sheets. They've got to be 100 percent cotton. So is that pretty common among consumers today that the ones on that sheets and towels, I would say so. We are starting to see more. And a lot of this has to do with polyester prices. Uh, you know, if you look at the global textile balance sheet right now, compared to 2018, mm -hmm. China is putting about 35 million more bales of polyester on, on the market. Uh, just for reference, last year, Georgia produced 2.1 million bales. Wow. So that, 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 there's a lot of polyester coming on the market. It's very cheap, uh, and that's hard for us to compete with. What changed? When did it change the dynamics uh, that polyester became that dry fit, cool feel to consumers? Where did we start seeing the changes? Was it with sports and athletics? I would say that was definitely the start of it. I mean, you can track it all the way back to the leadership if you wanted to. I, I'm not sure exactly where that dividing line is. But I can tell you, you know, when I, I talk to manufacturers, obviously mostly American-based manufacturers, their business is just as hard as farming, um, especially when they're competing with, with foreign, uh, foreign competitors that have much cheaper labor uh, and things like that. So, but I mean, at the end of the day, that's, that's part of the message we've got to change. Um, you know, if you see a 100% polyester product that's made in the USA and a 100% cotton product that's just say made in Pakistan. There's a better chance that that cotton came from the USA than that the raw product that went into that polyester shirt came from the USA. I can almost 100% tell you where it came from. It came it came from uh, the you know, Asia. So again, that was part one of Kenny Burgamy's conversation with Georgia Cotton Commission Executive Director Taylor Sills. Next week in part two, Sills discusses what he feels is the future of cotton while also touching on strategies for rising costs, global competition, and the role of research and development. Still to come on The Monitor, extension specialist Paul Puglis breaks down a common issue with ornamental cherry trees and shares tips on how to manage it. But first, the tiny sticker that's causing big problems for U.S. produce exports. How researchers are peeling back the layers on a multi-million dollar challenge. Price lookup stickers or PLUs that you find in the grocery store on your produce Many people complain about these stickers. The current challenge with PLUs is that the sticker and the adhesive are both petroleum based. France, New Zealand, many other countries are pushing with policy towards banning the import of produce from the US with those stickers. The USDA has been tasked to develop a biodegradable adhesive using biopolymer that is home compostable and commercially compostable and we're doing that with our industry partners. We have made over 250 formulations of bio-based ingredients into an adhesive that we hope will work for the whole compostable stickers. We also are varying the different methods that we use to apply that adhesive to the films and then also to dry and cure them so that we're mimicking what it will be like when our partners take this out and manufacture them and create these stickers that will go on the fruits and vegetables. It's a very challenging project because as you think about when these stickers might be used out in the field, the fruits and vegetables may be near freezing or it may be well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit when they're trying to be applied. So it needs to work over all these conditions 
The stickers also need to work over a variety of different surfaces. You can imagine that a kiwi is quite different than an apple, and quite different than a pear, or quite different from another fruit that may be coated with a wax to help protect its appearance. And it's really important that you get just the right amount of adhesive on. You want the sticker to be able to survive during packing and transport and to home. But when you're going to eat the fruit, you want to be able to easily pull off that sticker and have all the adhesive stay with it and not stay on the skin of the fruit and vegetable. In making these PLU sticker adhesives, we're helping to protect the exports for farmers who send crops to countries like New Zealand and France. And this protects about $68 million worth of exports to those countries, and that's just for grapefruit and sweet potatoes alone. The goal is to take this to pilot scale trial and eventually for our commercial partner to produce the adhesive at a commercial scale. And this would be an adhesive that you would see on your produce local for Hi, I'm Paul Puglese with the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension. Uh, today I'm looking at a tree that we get a lot of calls about here in Georgia. Uh, this is an ornamental flowering cherry tree. Uh, there's a lot of different types of ornamental flowering cherries. A lot of these are Japanese type cherries that are planted in landscapes. Uh, one of the more popular ones is a Yoshino cherry um, and there's a lot of other varieties uh, that, are, that are used for their flowering. Um, unfortunately, a lot of these types of cherries get a leaf spot disease uh, in the summertime. And this disease can actually start out uh, with little bitty um, spots on the leaves. Um, you get little brown spots that start out. And then um, as the disease progresses, uh, these spots, interestingly enough, will actually start to uh, fall out of the holes. Um, and so it actually looks like insect damage, uh, where an insect may have uh, chewed on the leaf and left a hole in it. But in this case, uh, it's actually caused by a combination of a fungus and a bacteria. Um, again, these are fungal diseases and bacterial diseases that infect the leaves. And the infection actually starts in the early spring. Um, it starts very, very early, uh, usually associated with you know, warm, wet weather, uh, like we had this spring this year. Um, we see that a lot in Georgia, and so um, this disease is very common throughout our state. This particular disease, again, is not something that uh, will kill a tree. Um, it looks bad and looks worse than what it really is, but a lot of people think their trees are actually dying. Uh, but most trees that are otherwise pretty healthy can tolerate this disease fairly well. Um, if you were to treat a tree, I would try to focus more on younger trees, um, trees that are maybe used as specimens close to your house or your landscape that are a little bit smaller. Um, and if you did want to treat, there are some fungicides that you could put out, but you have to put it out before, before the holes and the spots become apparent. Uh, because once the holes are there, they're going to stay on that leaf for the rest of the summer. So spraying doesn't do you any good at this point. So again, it's not the disease, the leaf spot disease so much that's the problem. It's sort of the secondary effect of it being defoliated and that tree opened up and being stressed during the middle of the summer. So again, um, we don't really you know, recommend spraying for this on larger trees, uh, but uh, again, if it's a specimen tree or a tree that you really wanted to try to, you know, a young tree trying to give it a head start, increase the longevity of that tree, maybe you would spray it. Uh, but the goal really should be to focus on reducing other stresses in that tree. So again, this is a common problem in Georgia. Um, if you have any other questions related to your trees, um, you know, feel free to reach out to your local county extension office uh, by calling 1-800-ASK-UGA-1 or go to our website at ugaextension.com and continue to follow us on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Paul, you are the best, thanks so much. And our thanks to you, the viewer, for watching. Until next time, stay safe and have a great week.